Hey everybody, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough. Welcome. Uh, today we have a very special video. I don't normally record or do live streams on Saturdays, uh, but I was sent, and of course I put the box in a weird angle, I got a copy of Cursed City. We're going to be digging through that today as we explore what Cursed City is about. Um, I have kind of a little bit of an agenda. Even though this is a live show, there is going to be a segment here at the end for a Q&A and that kind of stuff if you have any questions. But there are a few things that I want to get out of the way. And so today in our video, um, I'm going to go through like literally what you get inside the box because there are a few things I want to note about it. I want to talk you through some of the models that I have built because there are a few pitfalls when it comes to building these guys. So um, stay tuned. Like, it's actually very important. And then uh, what do we got here? Let's see. We're going to go through like the general idea of how the game functions and, and what they've been doing to make it uh, so interesting and, and different compared to Silver Tower. So uh, buckle in and, and get your thinking caps on. We're going to be having a good time. I am going to uh, move the chat so I can see it. Also, I went for the, uh, the creepy music playlist instead of the calm one that I usually do. <laughs> so uh, if the music gets annoying or whatever, just let me know and I'll swap it. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's, let's dive in here. Let's see. We move this. We got our downward cam. So <clears throat> I'll get to the models here in just a hot sec, but essentially let's see, we get a bunch of books. There's your model making guide. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, let's see, we have the War Scrolls book, which, yes, in case you are wondering, it does have uh, War Scrolls for each character, and we can walk through those in a bit. They're separated, all the heroes are in the front, all the villains in the back. Uh, nothing super stood out to me in terms of keywords, but they are, there are some really interesting things about them, and I like it quite a bit. So, give me one sec here. Okay. Just making sure I understood something. Yep, they do have the ogre keyword. Okay, so we'll come back around to that, but uh, there we go. And then there's two books, and these are very important to understanding how the game plays, so we'll kind of focus on them more in a bit. But you have your rule book, which literally goes through the basic mechanics of the game in terms of how units move and how you level up and all these kinds of things. Uh, and then you have the quest book, which is is basically how you generate your missions and and that kind of stuff. So that's the real core of the idea. Let me turn this fan off. This is blowing a lot of air in my face. So yeah, you have these two. Uh, they are inextricably linked, but the quest book is separate because basically it's a good way of keeping the lore contained um, and not giving you any spoilers as you kind of go through the city um, on your journey. So we'll move that for the models. Um, there were two sprues for the heroes. Actually, let me get them real quick. This is an important note when it comes to the models here. So your heroes come on these two. They, they kind of look like they were pre-primed with uh, gray seer. It's that kind of gray and I'm not sure it shows up the second uh, it hits the camera here. But what's interesting to note, and I just wanted to point this out, is that they are not on individual sprues. The small one here had the ogre and the carriage and overlord, and the larger one here had literally all the other heroes. So if you are on the fence about buying this, one thing that I will note uh, a couple of times here is be mindful that the, uh, I, there's no reason as to assume that these will be sold separately, right? These could be unique sculpts to the game. I do not know. Um, they could, you know, just put these two together, put this in a box. They have boxes this is exact size and sell them separately. I just mean like you can't buy just straight up, ah, dude, the witch hunter, that kind of thing. So, oh, Spezia, thank you so much, buddy. That means the world to me. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um... So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. We're gonna come back around, like I said, there's a few notes that I really wanna warn you about when it comes to actually building them, which is why I kind of, instead of having a pre-recorded video, I decided to actually build the models because I wanted some experience with them. Now, as for the villains, 
All of the unique villains, meaning the heroes that you have to fight, come on these two sprues. And that's your big Vargolf, that's uh, Rajikar the Wolf. He actually is a separate sprue, so he could be sold separately. Um, we'll get to the push fit things here, pretendification, in just a minute. So, and everybody else, that's the three little vampire lords. Um, this guy who, in America, you have to articulate his name as Gravedigger. Uh, we have him, we got uh, Skeleton Champion, and the two ogre bodyguards. So, those uh, all come on here. Again, just make note, Rajikar is the only one that comes separately. So he, I imagine, can get a blister pack very easily if you're looking for just that model. All the other unique characters, including the big Vargolf guy, uh, are coming on this one sprue. So there's that. Um, as far as other stuff you get, let me pull the box this way. And let's look through some goodies here. Uh, the the baggie that I had for bases, I accidentally tore it, and so it just like barfed all the bases, so I'm not even going to dig through them. Uh, these are two identical sprues that come with all of the minions that you're fighting. So on here, you'll find the skelly boys, zombies, bats, um, the rats, the objective markers, uh, all those things. I think that's all of it. They look great, by the way. Um, well, like I said, we'll go into the models here in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we have this, which if you are familiar with um, Blackstone Fortress, there is a super secret present, the Olfenkarn in Peril envelope. Do not open until the final assault decapitation journey has been completed. This is a little spoiler thing. When you beat Rajikar, you get to open this. And I am going to honor that because I'm going to be playing with y'all on streams and recorded games and all kinds of stuff. So this will be saved for a moment, uh, for a special, special moment. Uh, you also get an advert for the Warhammer Quest City Curse, sorry, Curse City novel, which I will be grabbing. Uh, and then I wanted to check out the dice. This is going to become a bigger discussion when we talk about how the game actually functions, but there are some very unique ones here. Uh, you have a whole bunch of D6s, which we'll explain how that works later, but your uh, uh, dice for attacking and defending against damage are actually these three right here for the most part. This one uh, is used to determine what the, you know, the NPC is doing. When you activate, say, a unit of skellies, they have like a behavioral chart. You roll that and you compare it to their chart and, and that determines how they act. And it does have sort of like a critical success where they get to like move three times and beat the crap out of people. Super interesting. Um, in terms of strength, I believe, I believe, uh, this is the, this is definitely the weakest. Um, and then it goes this, the blue, and then the red. That's from weakest to strongest. Like I said, we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, the mechanics of the game. And then a whole bunch of cards. Sorry. I, uh, I've been reading the rule book, so I know the cards. I just didn't have a, a reason to open them up yet. Uh, this is funny. This is basically your hit list <laughs> where um, you have to monitor how scared the populace is, how much influence Rajikar the wolf has, and which of his like lieutenants you have killed. So that's like your, your progress tracker almost. And for the rest of these, I will come back around to those when we talk about game mechanics. Let me see here. Some of this off to the side. Okay. Um, I haven't opened them up yet, but there are your your tile designs and the bases, and all of that. I uh, someone can you throw it in the chat because I have not been online much this morning. How much the set was? It would really mean the world to me. U.S. dollars for me. But that is the contents of the box. Now. Let's talk models, right? Because the first thing you do when you get into this is you're going to greedily uh, hack into a bunch of models. So I wanted to cover a few things here. 
Um, actually, I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have questions about what you get in the box? I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Um, about 200. Yeah, okay. That sounds about right. Um, I'm just going to say there are, there is, uh, there are many more hours of playability in this game than there are in Warhammer Quest Silver Tower. And we're going to talk about why. So I'm going to talk about the models next and then move into how the game functions. And so we'll go from there. Is there much art? Um, there actually is a bit. Let's see. That's a great question. So if you look in the quest book, uh, what I would say is uh, there is a lot of art. Um, you can get better resolution pictures of it. They've actually put quite a bit on the Warhammer community as they've been promoting this. Uh, a lot of it's stuff we've seen from the advertising. Um, yeah, one thing I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed with is like usually with these boxes, there's like a, a huge thing that's like the entire size of the box that has like, you know, art on one side and then it'll say like Warhammer Quest, Curse City on the other. And I like to frame those. I have like a Lumineth one. I have the Warcry one that I've had on my wall for a while. They didn't come with that. It is just black on one side. And I was like, oh, sad day. <laughs> um, is this likely to have expansion packs in the future like Blackstone Fortress? I would absolutely say so. It is very easy to expand. It would it would take very little to make new games, uh, to new levels and missions and stuff. Um, one hundred percent less ogre thalmaturge. <laughs> That's true. Uh, let's see. Is there much about the zombies and the sentient being the corpse garden? Uh, I'm gonna cover the lore in a bit. I'm still because the lore is kind of like uh, scattered throughout the quest book a bit. Um, I have a, a video coming out on Monday regarding the city itself, but then I'm going to go through and talk about the specifics because you don't really get a good feel for the locations until you're actually there. So it requires a little bit of like digging. So I can't answer that for you quite yet, to be honest with you. Okay, I'm going to move into the models. Um, basically, I built everything but the small minions, but... If you look here at the end of the book, to the ones that I have not built yet, uh, the nice thing is most of the, like the most numerous models, the skellies, the zombies, the rats, and that kind of stuff, they're all two to three pieces max, which is really nice because I looked at this and it was very daunting looking. Uh, but the truth is they snap together really, really quickly. And on the usage of that term, snap together, yes, these are snap fit models. They are single pose. Um, the skeletons, I believe, I haven't built them yet, but there are some options for like, you can have a sword or a spear, even though it's the same body. So, um, there, there's that for you. Uh, what else? Same thing with the zombies. There's a, there's a little bit of, uh, spare bits. So you will have some extras. Absolutely. Um, as far as, uh, things to note about the minion guys, not a whole lot, honestly. Um, Skellies are on 25 mil bases. Zombies are on 25 mils. Uh, the rats are actually on a 32. Bats are on a 25. And your objective markers are on 25s. So, uh, in case you were curious. Uh, I know some people were concerned because these are definitely like representative of the, the new skeleton models coming out that we know. Or were previewed recently. So, yes, they're still on 25s. Now... Let me just see here. Um, one thing that was super funny. Let me find it here because it's going to make you chuckle too. When I, when I first opened the box, I was greeted with this on top. And it's an errata. Basically, they, they accidentally misnumbered some of the parts in the actual book that they had printed beforehand. And I just wanted to point this out because, one, thank you Games Workshop for not letting us have another moment like um, Warcry where... The direction for the train wasn't actually what you wanted to do, and it was really confusing, and every YouTuber under the sun was just like, this is how you actually need to build it, please watch this video before you do anything, ever. <laughs> um, but I will say, I had a good chuckle when I opened the box, and I saw Errata on it, and I was like, hot diggity damn, these guys are getting on these FAQs quicker and quicker every single release. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just thought that was the best. Anyway, so thank you, Games Workshop, for taking the time to print. I mean, uh, uh, across the number of copies, this was fairly expensive. So thank you for taking the time to make sure that you had your directions right. It just made me laugh. Um, as far as specifics, the models are all snap fit. They have like a little peg and a little hole and you just kind of pop them together. I built, um, let's see, we have all the heroes here. And I'm just gonna say, I freaking love these models. Let's go through the heroes first. Uh, Jarok, oh. I'm going to change the music back to my normal thing because this is a little intense here. I just hear it like pumping in my ear and it's just a lot. I get overwhelmed easily. <laughs> How hard is it to listen to EDM while you do uh, a, a product review? Not very, but I can't handle much. Okay, here we go. And bring the chat back. There we go. <laughs> um, Jarek Delson. So for most of these, um, I clipped them off the sprue and I snapped them together. Easy peasy. And uh, I wanted to see basically how well the snap fitting was, like how accurate uh, were they in, in getting the pieces, um, you know, to get together. Cause sometimes snap fit can be so fickle. For all the heroes, I had absolutely no problem, uh, but I did go back and put plastic glue into some of the cracks and seams to seal it together. Cause some of them like Jensen, um, it's one of those things that like he snaps together, he looks great, but if you were to pull too hard on this this left arm here where he's got the hammer, um, that has the potential to pop out the chest piece because it's kind of like you lay the hammer in there and then you clip the chest piece over it. So my point is, do they snap together as advertised? Yeah, I had no problems with the heroes, but I would do something to seal them together so they don't pop apart and kind of tear up your paint uh, while you're doing stuff. So that is... That's my thoughts there. The only one that I had problems with, and this is one that I really do want to warn you about. Obviously the warning about the errata for this guy, pay attention to that. But the the Death Mage one with the insane beard that we should all be jealous of, um, he is a pain. <laughs> Not because he's complicated, he's actually like four pieces. This beard is so fiddly it is the most fiddly thing it actually ended up breaking twice and you can see um right where it touches the base and begins to turn back out like head to the right that area just kept snapping so just be very very careful when you're taking specifically him off the sprue had no problems with the archer i was worried about the arrow um nothing nothing was an issue there um Nobody else amongst the heroes had anything nearly as fiddly as that. So just, I'm actually gonna go and, and glue him even down to the base just to make sure, because you can see he already wiggles that much. I don't know. My thought is I just don't want to like, you know, say you're doing an encounter, I don't want to pick up another model, get it caught on that beard and pop it. So he's the one I really wanted to warn people about. And then we'll move on to some of the villains here. And these were much the same. I snapped them together to make sure I wanted to see how how if there were any gaps or that kind of thing um, all of them went together pretty well actually um, this is the guard captain the skeleton with the halberd be very careful with him he's kind of if you've built Eltharian from the Lumineth Realm Lords you'll be very familiar with this where it's like one, like for example, this arm up here that's holding the halberd, one part of it has the actual weapon in a fist and it lays into and pops into an empty gauntlet. So even though when it's glued, it doesn't feel very fiddly, it is very fiddly when it's on the sprue. So be very careful because you can easily break that wrist or that weapon. Um, and that's just my heads up. The one thing that I do want to point out when it comes to the villains specifically is this guy, the Vargolf. Um, he, I don't know if it's because of his size or what the, the snap together thing. I could not get it to work. I couldn't, I couldn't get his torso. He's kind of like four pieces kind of hold together like an empty shell. Could not get his torso to stay together in such a way that it allowed the arms to come into the pegs at the right angle. 
So I ultimately, for his arms and his feet, literally just cut the pegs off and plastic glued him in. And it sits flush, it's perfect. I just could not figure out for the life of me what angle they wanted you to put the joint into um, into the arm. Like it just wasn't not intuitive. Um, and, and honestly, given his size, you're gonna want a plastic glue because even if you do have uh, this entire arm is one piece and it's not compared to the rest of these guys who are very small the pegs um, can hold their entire bodies together but these arms are so long I mean, they're as long as a hero <laughs> um, when it gets to be that big the tiny little pegs that are there don't offer a whole lot of support anyway so I really would recommend for this guy specifically clip the pegs and then plastic glue him together and he, he's terrific he's a great looking model but uh yeah and all the other ones let's see uh this guy just be careful because that i assumed the knife on his back um we've seen this picture like the wizard guy who has like a somebody stabbed the board on him the knife is actually a part of the model so i thought i wasn't looking and i almost snapped up sorry hiccups are killing me this morning almost snapped off the uh the knife there and so yeah, that's all that I really had to say there about the, the model specifically. Um, as far as using them in your games, let's see. I'm just gonna breeze through this because I'm not a War Scroll expert or, you know, competitive gamer. Uh, essentially, we have the heroes, uh, we have the captain can be part of Cities of Sigmar, which just sounds awesome. Um, Ulfen Karn is a city keyword, which means this character cannot gain another city keyword. So I would love to see a full Ulfen Karn faction someday, but they're just meaning you can't have her be from like Hammerhall or whatever. Um, she's basically just, uh, honestly, a lot of these are just like, solo hero warriors they're very cool looking uh i would probably say don't expect like a ton <laughs> um i didn't realize that the carriage and overlord guy he's actually barak mornar which is the the skyport that i did today uh let's see they have miss cleo call me now who that's what i'm always gonna call her cleona zeitengale uh basically acts functions like a priest um what else yeah, like I said, I'm not going to go into the War Scrolls. They are available if you go, if you want to, if you really want to dive into the War Scrolls. When the G order, GW pre-order comes up and you go down to the product page, you can actually scroll down to downloads and get the actual War Scrolls for yourself. So you can, if there are specific ones you're interested or keyword synergies that you're looking for, go ahead and check them out there. There is no like, you know, all consuming rules like these characters have special properties and that kind of stuff. Nothing like that. Um, but one thing that is interesting is on the Death War Scrolls side, and I want to point this out because I love it. Um, so you have all your heroes and you can take them all. They're all unique. They're all named. Uh, and the points range from 100 to 120, but there are, the overwhelming majority of them are 100 points, which is fine. For the Death War Scrolls, zombies come in at 80 with a, ma sorry, um, skeleton warriors come in at 80 with a max of 280 points. So a 40 man unit of them. Zombies can go from 10 to 60. So you can have a huge big old thing of zombies. But then the rest of them, like literally all of the named generals and the bodyguards and Rajikar the wolf, unique. These models must be taken as a set for 680 points. Although taken as a set, each uh, is a separate unit. So you could just barf up the entire aristocracy of Wolfenkarn for 680 points on the table, which I just love. <laughs> oh, man. Can we get the human points? Which one's human? There's a, there's a couple humans. Uh, 100 points. I think all the humans are 100. Oh, the Lady Captain, the American Joan of Arc is 110. But they're all in that range. They're right there. The only one that's 120 is the Ogre. Yeah, there we go. That's kind of an odd choice, though. Oh, yeah, it would be um, 
it would be a super weird choice. I am so into it though, like absolutely, <laughs> I would do it. I mean, you know, I got a 680 point, no, I got more than that, but I was gonna say like a death army, because it's a bunch of leaders. Um, yeah, yeah, it includes one, two, three, four leader choices already. Boom, there you go. You picked out all your heroes for your death army. Okay, uh, so like I said, go check out the War Scrolls online if you are interested in, in learning more. So let's talk about the actual game. How does the game function? Well, we're going to cover the rule book first. You should read the rule book before you do anything because all the interactions that you have throughout this game um, will be based upon this. So let's put it off to the side and put the quest book off. When it comes to the rules, it's very simple. You generate your mission that you and your company are going to uh, go fight. There is a day-night cycle, which is phenomenal. Um, if you don't know, enemies get more dangerous at night. Uh, basically, the streets of Ulfenkarn are very unsafe uh, at any time besides the daylight hours. And so, yeah, let's see. Um, essentially, what you're trying to do when you play this with your friends, you take your merry band of warriors, you can have up to four players, and you are trying to kill Rajikar the wolf. He's the, the arch vampire leader of the entire city and stuff. However, they've tried to kill him before and he keeps coming back and they don't understand why. Like cities have tried to come in and save Ulfenkarn and they can't figure out why. And so your first task is to figure out how he keeps coming back to life or him and his lieutenants, all of them do. That's your first mission. And then you have to kind of work your way up to him boss style, where you're taking on um, the captain of the guard, his personal, you know, a zombie guy who makes his dudes. You have a wizard who probably has some knowledge about that. The Vargolf, you have his twin bodyguards who are ogres and have the ogre keyword, by the way. Then you have the the weird triplets of mini vampires and Rajikar the wolf. That's not like necessarily the order you have to engage them with, but Rajikar's last always. And then for these guys, I'm not sure if there's a, a linear order yet. I haven't read that part, <clears throat> but that's essentially the thing. Figure out how they keep coming back to life and take them out one by one with the final boss being Rajikar the wolf. In addition to that, there are a few other ways to play. See. That mission are what's called, oh, what is it called? What do they call it? Quest. They use very specific lingo for the different kinds of missions in this game. Let me just double check. Yes, hunt journeys. So when you're playing your game, you're going to pick, hey, this is the kind of journey we're doing. If you go with Ulfenkarn in peril, which is the main quest, um, that's when you're hunting enemies. The journey ones have a few different things but basically you're wading into the city trying to clear off some of the evil in it and then scavenge was when you're searching for supplies uh, there is deliverance and decapitation which is when you finally kill some of those named characters and stuff now here's the thing when you're playing a game this is a campaign game Right, this will require multiple playthroughs. You can't sit down and just finish Cursed City. I mean, you can if you believe in yourself and you have a bunch of money in the bank account for, you know, DoorDash to come and just supply you with sustenance for like a week, but I don't recommend it. Um, the way that the game functions at its core, and you use this little sucker to keep track of it, is not only are you trying to kill the, the enemies, right? In, in Warhammer Quest Silver Tower, you just kind of kept going into the tower, um, and at the end of it, you would get one piece of a, you know, MacGuffin, and then after you had eight pieces, then you could go for the, the Hail Mary and try and win. With Ulfenkarn, it's very specific where you're trying to balance the fear that the populace has of their lives, because if they give up hope, the city shuts down and is just consumed by darkness and the influence, the martial might that um, Regicar wields against them, okay? 
So the, all these different journeys that you do will aid you in your mission to, you know, to figure out why they come back to life and take out the general. So for example, hunt journeys, the heroes set out to destroy as many powerful minions of the Wolf King as they can find in order to weaken his hold on the city. This would be one where you're trying to lower the fear in the city or you're weakening his influence. Um, obviously, Open Card and Peril is the main quest. These are side things you have to do because if the city gets too scared, you lose. You lose the campaign as a whole. Scavenge journeys allow you to get supplies and level up and, and basically just re-equip so you can be a bigger badass when you go over to uh, the other enemies. Each of these has um, very specific maps. Uh, rather than um, Warhammer Quest Silver Tower, where you basically took the tiles and you kind of jumbled them up a little bit and you never knew quite where you were stepping into next. Um, the level as a whole had very specific tiles, but you didn't know which door you were walking into. These actually have full maps, um, which is nice. I like it. And uh, Deliverance. This is... The heroes try to help the citizenry escape the path of the suffocating grave tide, an endless spell that roams the streets. Um, and yeah, so sorry. This the hunting one is when you're breaking up his influence. The fear one is uh, deliverance is when you're trying to help the settlers. So, and then decapitation. Heroes attempt to deal a powerful blow to the Wolf King's plans by permanently destroying one of his most powerful followers. Um, however, if they should fail, they will have enraged a powerful undead creature that will vent its ire upon the populace. So, your main quest, and this is when you're just trying to knock down some more some more enemies. So, yeah, I uh, I like it. There's and this is when I said that there's a ton of ways to play the game where, um, you know. It's not all just core mission quests. There are reasons, and good reasons, they created enough of a motivation to do these side things, to keep the populace from, from falling to despair, to loosen his grip. But along that journey, you have to obviously go through the main crux of the game. Uh, for my purposes, I would not I would not be upset if we did like a main quest game and then like you know, mixed it up with one or the two or three of the other variants and then went back to the main quest game, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Is the spell included in the box? Uh, no, there, because the tiles are a very specific size and the model is very large, there's actually a little token um, that represents the grave tide. Let's see if I have a picture here. Herp. That would be in the front. Yeah, there's a suffocating grave tide token, um, and I understand. Like you can use the model if you want. It's just really cumbersome on this board, I would imagine. So there's that. <laughs> Plus, they you know modeled it directly into the sprue with like a bajillion other endless spells. So I don't expect uh, that to be separate. But so that is the the core of it. Um, let's see. I was building some Vargeist and the Leonair has extra wings. Uh, Jamie, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be doing hobby questions right now. I'm trying to get through this, but thank you. Thank you. I don't mean to dissuade you. Anyone in the chat can help you out. Um uh, yes, scavenge for supplies. And then uh, basically as you're exploring the city, it'll it'll prompt you very, very clearly, hey, flip over a crisis card. And basically what that is is just kind of a narrative thing that introduces more danger uh, to the setting. So, uh, let's see. Trying to find one that kind of makes a little bit sense. Um, we'll go with 99. The hero is taking no chances as they ram their weapon through the coffin. Fair or foul, either a lingering death has been prevented or a lurking horror has been slain. The acting hero gains one inspiration and the crisis ends. And so, what that is, is it basically a choose your own adventure thing built on top of this. As you're exploring, your crisis card will present to you a question. Depending on your answer, it'll tell you which number to go through. So we just read 99. And again, if we 
didn't do that, it would have some different number to give you the different outcome. And then they're kind of mixed together, so you can't like breeze really quickly ahead and just see the two options and that kind of thing. You have to like make decisions as the role playing game elements. Um, yeah, so that's that's really cool. And that's something I really liked about the Silver Tower was that kind of narrative element. This one, in my opinion, is a great balance between Blackstone Fortress and Silver Tower where there's enough crunch mechanically um, to be more interesting, but it still retains, you know, the choose your own adventure feeling. So as you're going through these cities, you will be making decisions and you can re reflect on what decisions you made the last time you got that crisis card. And there's a ton of them. So you're not going to have the same one over and over and over again. But, you know, if you play a lot, you will eventually. And that's cool. Um, any questions? about the overall arc of the game because I'm going to talk about character cards and how how characters function in this game here in just a second. So like I said, I'm going to uh, just kind of pause here for a moment and give you all a chance to answer. So we have our rule book and our quest book. Again, the rule book, um, you're going to want to read this first. It just introduces the mechanics. Uh, I'm just going to say this while I'm waiting for questions to come in because uh, my chat, there's a delay between you and I. Um, it does a wonderful job. There's actually like a four page spread where they literally walk you through a tutorial as if you were playing at a games workshop store. Like, and that was just a very thoughtful thing. Obviously, I think that this was in design long before, you know, COVID or whatever that, but the idea of it, I mean, when I say it literally walks you through, it's like, take this dude, put him here, put another guy here learn these actions, this specific action until you have mastered it and then move on. And then it goes the same thing for movement, for hostiles, recuperating, for healing from wounds kind of a thing. So it's a wonderful deal. I was actually kind of concerned when I get to games like these um, that they're gonna be too hard to learn. It was very intuitive and I like the fact that they include, they, you know, it's a 30 page booklet for the rules and they took four of them uh, to really be like, you know, when you're first playing, these are the interactions, this is the lingo we use. And I feel like it was done, frankly, a lot better than they do most of their games. Like, I wish AOS had something similar. Okay. Um, let's see. Silver Tower had additional rules for Zinch Demons. Does this for um, Flesh Eater Quartz or Night Haunt? Ooh, let me see. So they had, that book had rules at the end of its quest book. So let's see if it's there. There are some specific missions, but now I'm not seeing any additional like built-in rules. Although that could easily be a great expansion if they released like a Flesh Eater Quartz hero or something. Uh, so to answer your question, no, but that's a great point. Um, What do you think the first expansion will be? I don't know, but just based on the conversation we just had, uh, I would be cool if they pulled in other death factions. It thematically would make perfect sense. Uh, do they give an estimate for how long a hunt is expected to be? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. They don't, off the top of my head, I was just reading through this last night. Let's see. I honestly imagine, well, because they're not all the same, right? Depending on what kind you're playing. Like if you did like a resource one, I, that could be, have a different sort of time frame than a hunt. Oh, let's see. So I'm just looking through here. Um, prepare the combat map, yeah. Um, also, yeah, you, so for you decide on your type of journey and then you roll your D12 and it determines what what your deployment is, meaning uh, what the map is, what the, the mission basically is gonna be, the crises that occur. Um, let's see. When these hostiles are slain during a hunt, move the quest token two spaces. Okay, so a hunt would be your, your fastest one because um, you're basically trying to, every time you do a certain action based on what the journey is, you move your campaign 
progress tracker like forward and when you when you destroy hostiles in a hunt one uh, you move the token two spaces instead of one so if you get killy with it if everyone just focuses on murder and stuff it should jet across pretty quickly but no i don't have a time estimate for you i'm sorry um how does it differ from blackstone fortress unfortunately i don't i don't i never i don't know the core rules of blackstone fortress enough i played it once at a buddy's and that was it uh so i couldn't really tell you a lot of it's very similar i can tell you um there's far less books for it my god blackstone fortress had like a bunch of different reference things you had to go tear through um do you know anything about the guy added in the novel till i finish it so i can't tell you that i don't know is there a yes there sorry omniphage there is a video where nick baton over on gdubs he kind of walks you through uh basically the the not the quest book so much but the rule book like how the dice and stuff interact with you so um did they take your suggestion and include the mothman no <laughs> uh let's see i know the minimum is four characters what's the maximum uh the minimum is what where was it i mean i started that sentence sounding really confident you know, my voice was booming, and then I just realized, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Give me one sec. <laughs> okay, getting ready to play. Pick heroes. So if there's only one player, he controls four heroes, and it goes up to four players. If there are four players, uh, each of them picks a hero. So, yeah, it is a one to four player game. Not all your heroes will be in play at any given time. So what do they give you? Eight heroes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep. So that is what it is. Um, well, Warren, what factions can you include the good heroes in? Head over to the Games Workshop site. Uh, but they, they have all the war scrolls there. I'm not going to go through the keywords here. We're talking about Curse City, not... AOS. Uh, let's see. Cazador man. I love it. Lance wins with his, his fallout reference. Okay. Let's talk about characters, how the game plays. So that's how you start it, right? You, you choose your, what kind of journey you're going on. You set up the board and whatever the twists are. Um, they call them crises in here. Kind of like the narrative elements. That's what you're setting up there. But then you pick your heroes. And we'll get to the other four here in a hot sec. Um, the way it works, your turn works, is you have the activation phase. Where, let's say I am playing... Actually, let's make this even simpler. We'll just go through one, and then we'll kind of highlight what's unique about the others. We're going to pick Jelson Derrick. Why? Because he's got a gun the size of America. So when you do your um, activation step... You roll your dice, and you roll the number of dice as you have equal to this many empty spaces. The reason that is, is as you take damage, these spaces will be filled up, and a damaged character will have less action dice to be able to do a thing. That's super important. You don't want to be hurt. Um, there are tons of ways to remove and add damage and all that kind of stuff. Those are the minutia I'm not going to get into, but essentially... On turn one, you would roll and you'd have something like this. Now, there are universal actions that every character can do. Uh, for example, a move action is a one up, meaning any dice you can sacrifice to do that. You know, there's gonna be modifiers at some point, I'm sure, but uh, you can always move. If you choose to move, you can move the first movement value here. So if I use that on a one up move action, I can move him three spaces. Uh, the spaces are, if you're curious, are, I think are 35 millimeters wide. Um, and there is that. So you can also run. Run is a three up, however. So you have to spend something higher and he can move the higher value. So um, that's pretty rad. You know, basically that's how the the walk and run system works you can get more speed but you're sacrificing something higher for it when it gives you uh your three attributes here agility defense and vitality 
Agility is interesting because it kind of denotes your ability to... It's, it's kind of a mix between, like... Um, not guile, but I'm trying to think of, like, quick reaction speed. If there's a trap, it'll often have you test against your agility. Um, when you determine turn order, which I'll get to in a minute, you can actually kind of do a gambit where you can spend one of your dice to try and move higher in the um, the priority order. so Or initiative order, that's what I meant. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing. I like it. So uh, there's a few things there, and it does correspond to what kind of dice you roll. So for an agility, you would get this guy because it's a little blue triangle. Here's my little blue triangle. I'm gonna pull these dice out because we are gonna be chatting about them to understand them better. So, um, for any of these attributes, agility, defense, and vitality, you are going to roll one of these suckers. Now, there are three kinds of sides to each and every one of these dice. There's a blank side, which is a fail. There's a one star, which is a success, Meaning, if you attack, you just do the damage it does. And then there's a two-star side, and that's a critical success. Um, so, for example, on his agility die, uh, he has... What's that? That's two criticals there. Two successes. So he has a 50-50 shot of succeeding and a one in four chance of critting. Essentially, something like that. So, that's pretty great. You know, why not? The way this works is if you're attacking, we'll go with his Ardent Blade, which is a one plus skill action, so he can spend something cheap to do that. And he's gonna roll one of these red dice. If you get a success, he does the number of, he does damage equal to the first number on the damage thing. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's a two slash three. So he would do two damage there. If he gets a critical, he does the second amount. That's ex exactly the same way it works in Warcry, if you have played that one. Um, and then, you know, some, some of the attacks, they have you roll multiples, and, and then those do stack concurrently. Um, yeah. Uh, the worst die, of course, is the white one. Uh, this is actually a free action for him. Uh, this weapon action cannot be made by spending activation dice. So essentially it's a finishing move <laughs> where he he's stabbing you, he's shooting you, and then he puts the stake into your heart real quick. So uh, his unique abilities, ruthless. Each time an attack uh, roll made for this hero is successful, if the target is still visible, meaning he didn't die, this hero can make one free stake attack weapon action against the same target. Um, but the white die, I talked about how it's the worst. Uh, only there's only one success, one critical success on a six-sided die, so that's not the best odds. Um, whereas on this one, the D12, you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So there's four. It's four and four, right? So there's four crits, four regulars, and then four blank spaces. Uh, which means two-thirds of the time this one's gonna do something awesome uh, About half the time this one's gonna do something awesome and like a third of the time this one's gonna do awesome That's how that works um, You can each carry one item and You can actually gain artifacts you can gain special weapons and armor You would just put those cards right here of whatever he's toting an item is kind of like a like a vial of something or a first aid kit That kind of thing something a little different uh, Let's see he does have judgment, his big old gun. Um, and the way they kind of handle guns in this is it's it's a normal attack. Uh, has a higher cost, so it would require a five up, which is expensive. And then um, it's a ranged attack, meaning anything that's not immediately next to you can be targeted. And then, and understand, immediately next to you doesn't count diagonal. It does, in fact, count diagonal. Sorry, I kind of said that weird. Uh, so you have to be totally clear of anybody to be able to shoot your gun. And uh, it does have reload, which uh, was kind of the problem that Silver Tower has, that range characters were just... You could just crush things from afar very easily. This one, um, you can only make that weapon action once per turn. So he could, in theory, spend this to shoot the gun, spend a cheap one to move, 
Now he's in range of a target to hit him with uh, the Ardent Blade. And after he does the Ardent Blade, he gets a free Firewood Stakes attack based on this. And for that last one, he can either... Uh, there's a few other actions you can choose to do, but that's, that's the core of it. So if your guy is healthy, you get four actions based on the dice that you have. And um, there is still, if you're curious, from Silver Tower, a pool of Destiny dice, which any player can reach into and take. Um, if your character is wounded to where all the compartments here are filled up during your activation step, you don't roll dice, but you can still take from the Destiny dice pool if your character needs to do something. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, what else? Let's see. Any questions about how heroes interact? It's very straightforward. Um, and that's actually one of the things I like about this game. Because uh, they kept the same model as Silver Tower. The things that changed, if you've played that one, um, are just... They have now unique dice. They introduced the hit and crit mechanic. So, you know, there's a normal hit and then a critical success. And that works for defense and offense the exact same way. Um... If it's a success on a defense roll, you lower the amount of damage they take by one. If it's a crit, I think it's you lower it by three or something like that. Uh, the basic idea is all the heroes have defensive stats. The minions that you go through, all the skellies and the zombies and the bats, they don't. So it'll save time there. They just take the damage. The idea is... You know, this is a conquering bunch of explorers and heroes. <laughs> Warren, do you think this will be easy enough to play over the internet if one person owns it and the others are watching slash playing? Well, we're going to experiment because I'm going to make that happen. Um, but yeah. How is the triangle dice not a d4? Honestly, I was thinking the same thing. When I opened this up, I was like, oh, that's not what I expected. I did think it was a d4 from... Like when they showed the preview of the artwork, and I was just like, huh, okay. But, you know, I like it. <laughs> uh, so is the system easily adaptable for Silver Tower? Well, uh, just looking at the basics of it, if I would say that, hmm, I think it's easier to bring Silver Tower characters into this than this game format into the Silver Tower because there are different kinds of journeys that you can go on. And, you know, because if you're bringing the Silver Tower people over, all you have to do is find a good a balance and equivalent for which agility, defense, and vitality dice they have. Um, because their attacks and stuff are almost written the same way, right? Um, the damage is a little bit different because the Silver Tower ones didn't have the crit, but you can write those in. Just a crit does, you know, plus one damage kind of a thing. You can keep it very simple. But the actual mechanics of, you know, they all have unique abilities and Path of Glory. There's some minutia that might have to be worked out, but I think it's very easy to. And I, I do intend to kind of put out a uh, PDF uh, at some point on the channel about doing the, just that. Bringing those characters to Ulfenkarn. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Never played any GW box game, but I know you were talking about it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, at this point, I would probably say if, if you are interested in the quest series, I'd probably just say start with this. Don't worry about Silver Tower right now. But uh, it does seem to be pretty, pretty transferable bringing heroes to this. So that's exciting. Um, important question. Can we put Gotrek in Cursed City? Uh, I mean, if you want to make up your entire card for him, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically you can. Um, so one thing I want to cover next, actually I'm going to just cover, so his his jam is he's kind of a good all-rounder, he's got a great gun, and his melee attack, the Ardent Blade, is pretty great. Um, he could be more defensive, but it is what it is, he, he has, he trades a heavy defense for uh, having a good agility and defense stat, kind of a mediocre at both. We have um, Captain Melda Braskov who is a little bit more limited on attack. She is a melee beast with her Dawnlight, the big claymore she's wielding. 
Not very agile in her heavy armor, but she does have a better vitality stat, which comes into play when you're like trying to shrug off wounds that you've already taken, um, and, and then like other rules interactions that you use the vitality stat kind of a thing. So um, yeah, that's basically it. So she, she's a little bit more tanky, but melee centric only. Uh, she has a unique ability, Death Blow. This can only be made once per turn. Pick two hostiles that are adjacent to each other, or two hostiles in the same space. The the small minion dudes, you can have two guys per space. All the other heroes are one per square. Uh, these hostiles must also be adjacent to the hero. You get to make one free attack based on each of them. So if you have a six, you can basically do a killer finishing move on multiple enemies. Um... Once per turn, during the Gambit step, this hero can swap the position of their initiative card on the combat tracker with that of one other hero who agrees to switch positions. We'll get to the initiative thing immediately after I talk about uh, these guys. Then we have Brutog Corpse Eater, the least agile. Fairly good defense, but his vitality stat is absolutely the best with the red die. Um, He's just, he, he can just take punishment. That's his whole jam. Um, let's see. Beyond that, just a lot of unique abilities that help you tenderize things. Honestly, there's less information here than on a Age of Sigmar War Scroll. So for the purposes of somebody asked earlier about playing with people online, if you send a picture of this and you're like, hey, just take a look at this, it's, it's extremely straightforward. It just tells you which dice to roll. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a very very simple game. Um, this is our Qualathis, the Exile. She also has a blade, but interestingly enough, they're trying to make her an archer character. Is that she, her blade? It requires a four up, so she does not want to be in combat, and it sucks. So if enemies get into combat with her, she is a sad panda. Winter's Call is the name of her bow, which is what she wants to be using because that's the one up. Uh, attack action it's ranged um she when she starts the game if you take her in your party during that particular mission um she gets three oaken arrow counter tokens basically she she brings three special arrows with her and so oaken arrow and a six up discard one of the tokens and make one free winter's call weapon action damage suffered from that weapon action cannot be reduced or ignored so she gets a super arrow uh she gets three of them per round or per journey i'm sorry um then she goes back and kind of gets them back um yeah let's see let me have glario van alten the third I like him. I want to. I want to hear like Tarantello playing. Dun, 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 okay. Um, he. Let's see. Okay, duelist. You can shoot the gun once per gram. Duelist six up. This action can be made once per turn. This hero makes one free weapon action and one free move action or run action in any order. So he's like a hit and run type thing. If the free weapon action uh, is Geist Sever, which is a sword, uh, and the attack action is success, it is treated as being a critical success. So he's very good at dual, uh, just getting up in there. Now, because he has a pistol, it's, it's a dual type, meaning he can use it in combat or ranged. He can do whatever, which is kind of cool. Uh, let's see. Um, we got Dagni Holdenstock, which is our carriage and overlord guy. By the way, I just want to say this model is super badass. Um, I like him quite a bit. I'm going to have a ton of fun painting him. Uh, I love the fact that he he does he can technically run, but his movement and his run speed are exactly the same. <laughs> He's just like, <laughs> this is the slowest guy. His fastest is still the slowest. I think that's amazing. Uh, and he is all defensive. So he he doesn't like getting hurt, but he's good at resisting damage. So like if he's harder to shrug off wounds once he takes them, but he's harder to hurt. Uh, and his weapons are badass, both of them, in combat and at range. Uh, he has a harpoon gun, and he can actually pull enemies towards him, which was wonderful for pulling out some of those leader models and that kind of stuff. Uh, and one thing, I'm just going to kind of breeze through these last two. We have our 
two priest slash wizard characters and they just don't want to be in combat whatsoever but their unique abilities are very useful when it comes to uh being part of the team uh because the miss cleo she can heal and and kind of take ailments from a hero um and then she has basically like a, a arcane blast type of attack and this guy can damage himself in what is it this action can use my turn this hero suffers one damage until the start of the next hero's next activation the damage value of the hollow stare which is his attack uh, is three five so he can he can kind of supercharge a bit so I think that's kind of cool. Now, all of these characters, as they do things throughout the game, gain what's called inspiration tokens. And at a certain point, you flip them over and you use... It's the exact same card, it's just on the back. It has like a golden outline. And it just gives them better stats. Um, what's his... Yeah, so for him, he gets a better vitality die. And do the weapon things change? Not too much on him. Although he does unlock a new ability. Um, yeah, what's Miss Cleo got? Heavenly Alignment. Let's see. Before the initiative step, this hero can pick one hero, discard the hero's activation dice, add two to the score of that hero's activation dice. That's rad. So it's very interesting um, the way that the inspiration stuff works. Basically, it's sort of like a darkest before the dawn. As you're getting your teeth kicked in and you're taking enemies out, um, you can flip the cards and now they're better much like they do in warhammer underworlds so yeah um let's see uh solo means you get to play co-op with smarter players than having a socom boon fall i don't know i don't get that reference but um yeah let's see Um, Jamie, generally about how much are the expansions? Expansions for Blackstone Fortress were between, honestly, they were in the gambit from like 50 bucks to 110. It depends because not all the expansions had models or and some of them had like, here's one unique character and it came with expansion rules for an engagement with that character. Whereas other ones were like, here's a whole sprue of models. <laughs> so it's kind of a, it's kind of a rough one there. I'm not quite sure how to. I gotta tell you that. Now, for your enemies, they also have cards. This is, they, instead of having an inspire mechanic, they simply have day and night. As your journey begins, you always start early in the day, but as things progress, uh, you fall into nighttime and all of them have an empowered nighttime version, which you do not want to fight at all. Um, so what that means to me is that time is a factor. You don't want to waste your turns, you know, if you don't have to stop and like heal up and doing a respite action or whatever, um, you don't want to. You're racing against the clock at all times. And that's really cool uh, because, you know, you might have, a, you know, a wound on you and you want to wait and get, you know, your fourth activation die access. But the truth is, is like, that just means it's going to hurt you later on when your enemies are more punishing. So going through your turn right now might just be the best idea. Uh, for each of them, let's say, for example, the mission has you put six Olfen Watch, that's the Skeleton Boys, on the table. Okay, and I just made that up. I'm not sure if that's a thing. But let's say you throw six on the table. No matter where they are in the board or how spread out they are or anything like that, you activate them all as like a species so for example i would say i'm activating the olfen watch i'm gonna roll one behavior die 11. dance macabre uh each acting hostile makes a move action and then makes a charge action which means they get to move move and attack okay very crazy so that would that would be a killer die so that means all of the olfen watch like no matter where they're spread out or anything like that, all of them activate simultaneously. They all do the same action. It's very simple for bookkeeping. Uh, and I like that quite a bit. So, yeah. Um, what else? So we got those guys. Uh, as far as how initiative order works, I like it. So, 
basically, let's see. Let's see if these are the right ones. Okay. So for each person playing, because there are four adventurers, there are these four die uh, symbols. They don't mean anything intrinsically. They're just there to be separate. And I, I would be like, hey, I am the dwarf guy. Uh, I'm gonna play this card, right? And so I'm gonna take this one. I'm gonna claim it as the representative of my character. Everybody does that. You then take these. You shuffle them into a deck because the backs are identical. These are the same things but for enemies. And all of them correspond to a specific enemy type. And so then you shuffle these cards together. And I'm just going to put out a, a fake, you know, combination here. Uh, let's do this just for demonstration purposes. So yeah, you shuffle the deck and then you lay these little cards out. This is how you start a journey. And at this point, there is a gambit step. This is the one I mentioned earlier. You roll on your agility die. And if you succeed, you can basically move yourself around in terms of priority. Um, if you get a success, you can move somebody adjacent. If you get a critical success, you can move to any enemy. So if this guy got a success, he could swap out his location with one of these two. If he got a crit, he can do any one of them so he can bring himself to the front of the pack. And of course, there are rules, like we mentioned before, we were talking about Miss Cleo. Uh, if, if someone agrees to it, you can also switch with them. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Question, does Curse City require a DM? Um, no, no DM specifically. They have a role that they call leader. And what that, what that means is it's just someone to, um, you just kind of elect one person in your group that, Hey, if there's like a discrepancy or different effects trigger at the same time, we just, we just nominate someone to make the choice for us. That's all it is. So you need someone to kind of lead the game, but no, no DM. Everyone can play. So yeah. The moving cards around mechanic is the same in Blackstone Fortress. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. But uh, I guess I guess the demo I played, he must have just he had all the heroes go first. So I, I think it was just for ease of ex explanations. Uh, let's see. How long would you expect a single game to last? You know, I don't have a good answer for you. I will let me play around with it more. I'm gonna play a solo game just to kind of get my sense of it. Um, and I can report back. My gut tells me it's probably gonna be about an hour and a half to two hours. That is my guess, at least while you're learning the game. Because between setup, we have to actually design the tiles and the board. You know, if one person in your gaming group owns it and they have it like all ready to go for game night, I'm sure that you can crank a game very quickly. Um, but you have to remember that this, is, because it is a campaign style thing, there's the setup for every mission, the character stuff, you have to deploy the table the way it's described, and then there's an entire cleanup step where it's like, okay, how's the populace doing? Did we lessen his grip? Did we gain any artifacts? Did we search for anything? That, so there's like, you know, I don't know. So anyway, there's that. Let's see. Is my group's forever DM, that's a huge selling point. <laughs> yeah, no, it really, it, it, it is fantastic. Um, like I said, you know, it will, you have to have somebody be a leader. That's a non-negotiable because there are some rules in here and the way that they word it is pretty interesting where it'll say like, um, leader's choice. And so you need someone designated to make a decision. Um, it could be something like, you know, uh, how do I wanna word this? Um, in leader order, which means your leader chooses the order of things to happen. So, yeah. So that is how the mechanics of the, the basics of the game work. Um, adversaries, just a few couple notes here I threw down. Uh, adversaries do not have defense dice. They just take the damage, but that's represented, you know, by how many wounds they have. Um, like Rajikar the wolf, he's a monster. He moves six, he has 10 wounds. Uh, and just a whole bunch of nasty attacks. Let's see. Yeah, he reduces all damage coming into him by one. I don't know, there's just a whole bunch of stuff. 
that make him super scary. Um, so as I'm kind of winding down this explanation, what else do you guys have questions about? Because like I said, I'm, I am kind of winding down a bit. My voice is getting a little sour and I got to head out here pretty soon. I'm just going to throw this out there while you guys are asking last minute questions. Uh, question, do you have the wizard character? Can you share a picture of the wizard character? No, I don't. The Curse City, like the... You said the Curse City book. Like, the wizard character that comes... I don't know what you mean. I'm sorry, Arnold. There's the characters that are already on the website, but I don't have anything beyond that. Do the uh, player characters level up and gear up? Yes. So we have uh, treasure that they can each carry. Um, let's see. There's the crisis cards. Um, basically, they can all carry uh, Realmstone. And by inspiring and doing great deeds, that's how they can level up. Yes, there are... Let's see. I didn't look at the level up stuff too much in detail. Um, there's this huge mother heffin deck of uh this is like artifacts and weapons and stuff each one of them can wield one unique uh piece of armor and one unique weapon i believe um and it just gives you more options for your attack profiles and essentially when you're playing the game you can pick up realmstone and it'll have the cost here cost for realmstone and that's how you can buy them there is kind of like a honestly honestly if it's kind of like vermintide the game like the video game where you know you go out and you do your mission then you come back to the inn and that's where you can buy stuff and um yeah uh, let's see combat tutorials i'm gonna look up the level up stuff there's the turn encounter uh, card ailments uh so there are some negative modifiers to stuff um you can give people, uh, people can receive diseases or be buried. That's nasty. Um, okay, journeys ends. So yeah, this would be the resolution here. Um, extraction. Increasing a hero's level. Each hero starts the Ulfen Karn in, Quarrel, in Peril quest on level zero. As the heroes succeed in their journeys, they will gain experience as explained in each journey's consequences. So yeah, when you go to the actual journey, well, what, that would be the other book. Let's just pick one and uh, take a look at it here. Okay, yeah. So it says there on the journey that I just picked the first hunt one. Consequences, if the heroes are successful, they each gain experience. Uh, see page 34 of the rule book. We'll be right there in a second. Uh, in addition, shrink influence. So the influence that Rajikar has over the populace by two. Um, if the heroes fail, there are no additional penalties. So this is a pretty safe one. <laughs> pretty much is what they're telling you. And it's also the, the kind of mission they suggest you do for your first round. Um, okay, so experience. Each, so yeah, so at the end of a mission, if you're successful, it will tell you how much experience to earn, if you gain experience or if you gain supplies, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you do gain experience from your journey, heroes gain experience each time they are successful in a journey. When a hero gains experience, give that hero a novice experience token. If a hero gains experience and they already have a experience token, replace it with a veteran. If a hero has a veteran, discard it and that level, hero's level increases. Okay, shoot, dang, that's a lot. Okay, hold on a second here. Um, but what does it say? So I understand increasing a hero's level but it does, okay, here we go. <laughs> it kind of like trailed off as a thought there. I'm not quite sure. I was like, but what does that mean if you are a veteran? Okay, here we go. When a hero's level is increased, they permanently gain a powerful trait. Uh, the trait they gain is based on their level and their class. A hero's class is presented on the character card under their name and description of each class can be found. Okay, yes. So they each have uh, a few things here. 
take the trait card for their class. Okay, so basically as they're leveling up, there are just special rules that are part of this deck that you tack onto your guy. Um, you gain an experience for every successful mission you do as well as other things that will tell you if you gain more experience. There is a cool thing called Quick Learners. If a hero takes part in a successful journey with another hero of a higher level, the lower level hero gains experience twice in this step. So, so for example, and this is why it's so nice, um, let's say that you and your normal gaming group play, you just have four heroes that you like, right? I'm just gonna pick these random four. But then one week you invite a new buddy over and they wanna play and they wanna pick somebody who isn't one of these guys or you wanna try something else. So let's sub out him for Miss Cleo. Well, if these guys are all like level three, Miss Cleo here is going to be able to level up twice as fast because you're trying to catch the characters up. And so I like that quite a bit. Um, yeah. Did they make it easy to keep track of everything between game sessions? Um, as far as the actual bookkeeping goes, hmm. You know, honestly, not really. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, I just had a crazy thought. Hold on one second. I thought I had a, a perfect sleeve for this that had like a pocket that I could put the, um, any kind of upgrades you have. No, what I would um, suggest if you are playing this, what I plan to do honestly, because I plan to play with so many folks over and over again, is I'm basically going to laminate these. And so instead of having a token that's representative of what level they are, I'm just gonna take a dry erase pen and put it in the corner. Um, and then I, that way I can like take a, a book clip or a paper clip and just clip the literal cards of what they have equipped and that kind of stuff. And I'll just do that. That's my thought. So Doug doesn't know about the special character card that came with the collector's edition. No, no, they sent, I mean, to give you a peek behind the curtain, um, they didn't tell me I was getting this until just a few days ago and it arrived late Thursday. I don't, I think you guys think I'm way more involved with Games Workshop than I actually am. <laughs> I don't know a dang thing. I know about the $200 box of stuff they sent me and nothing else. There we go. Um, I know Blackstone Fortress had little baggies. Uh, there actually are a ton of little tiny sandwich bags and stuff in the bottom that I'm sure are designed for that exact reason, where you can separate the, the cards uh, individually. So anyway, um, let's see, he'll know about it. He said something about reading the book first. Yeah, I will eventually. So anyway, friends, I'm gonna go ahead and close this video out. I hope it was helpful for you. Like I said, uh, if, you, if you hopped in later, we went through what you get in the box, uh, a few important notes about building the models. So again, if you're getting this set, go back, listen to that part. I have a few heads up for you. And we kind of walk through the basics of, of the rules and, and kind of what the mission is for the game. So, uh, let's see. That oh well, I knew about the character. I didn't. I just didn't know that. Uh, frankly, that y'all were gonna care enough. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. But um, like, I knew there was a character in existence coming, but not necessarily what that uh, card or war scroll was. But anyway, friends, uh, I will let you go to now. I'm going to go have a nice lunch date with my lovely wife, who is patient. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. So look forward to a couple streams this coming week as I build and paint these guys up. Um, the Discord is ready um, for, for gaming with y'all, and so we're going to get cracking on that. So anyway, thank you, friends. I will catch you next time. Happy Wargaming. <laughs>